Watering of tomato plants is rather important. We either overdo it or underdo it and the expertise in getting it just right. If we give too much water, we cause waterlogging, we cause root death, and then we start to get nutrient deficiency symptoms and the leaves start to wilt. Um, if we underwater, then we run the risk of getting, um, say, blossom end rot on our tomatoes when the ends of the fruit start to go browny black and kind of um, sink inwards. Not good at all. So when you plant your tomatoes, try initially just to water the area where you've put the tomatoes. But as the roots start to grow outwards, then you can apply more water and build up. But always relate the watering to the size of the plant, how many trusses have set, how much of the fruit is swelling, and how good the leaf is on the plant. And of course, always relate it to the weather conditions the previous day. Now, let's assume you've got your plants established and they're about three and a half to four feet high. Lots of trusses, the bottom trusses are beginning to ripen and you're wondering what to water at nine o'clock in the morning. Always water in the morning. It dries off by night, less disease. So nine o'clock in the morning, what was it like yesterday? If it was blazing hot all day, wall to wall sunshine, I'd be thinking about two, two and a half, maybe a little bit towards three pints of water per plant at nine o'clock in the morning. If yesterday had been a mixture of sunshine and cloud and you know something like that then I would think thinking about a pint and a half to two pints of the water per plant. But if you say yesterday was cloudy and cold and miserable and everybody wanted to stay inside then maybe you only need to apply a pint, a pint and a half of water per plant would be adequate. Always relate the watering to the crop, the size of the plant and the weather conditions the day before. All tomato plants need to have their flowers pollinated and pollination simply is the movement of pollen from the male anthers onto the female stigma. The pollen grains germinate, grow down the style, into the ovary and a presto, a baby's on the way. The little tomato's going to start to form. Now for that to occur, then we need to have good light conditions. It's nice to have some humidity in the air. And of course we can do that by putting some water on the pathways, uh, squirting some water at the plants on a hot day and encouraging some humidity. But an important thing that every gardener can do whenever it's sunny and warm is to go and tap the trusses with your fingers, tap, 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 and let the flowers stutter about like that, or shake the plants with the canes or the wires that are supporting the crop, anything to agitate the flowers and move the pollen about. Well, you've got one or two pests that are notoriously difficult with, um, with tomato crops. I've got to say, white fly inevitably occurs in many amateur garden tomato crops in the greenhouses and it can be a difficult one to control. Now you can buy um, um, pesticides and something like um, uh, Bug Clear here will have a go at whitefly and that's a particularly good product but there are a number of products which will also always tackle whitefly. Now the problem with whitefly is you kill the adults as they're fluttering about on the plants. And you know you've got white fly because um, when you touch the plants, woo, all the white fly flutter up and then settle down again. So you spray to control the adults. It will not control the little uh, immature scales, which are just kissing the surface on the underside of the plants. And of course, when they hatch out to produce the adult white flies, then you've got the same problem again. So if you're going to use a pesticide like this, then you will need to repeat it uh, in order to catch the uh, future generations which are turning into adults. But of course, you can get the simple oover out, shake the plants, let the white fly flutter up, and then oover them up. Or you can get a little sticky card to hang amongst your tomato plants. Shake your tomato plants, the white fly come up and then they will land on the, the sticky trap and that will help to reduce the conditions. You can of course spray them with water and bog them down in a puddle of water on the floor. So another common pest of course is red spider mite. What we usually call two spotted spider mites because on its back, roughly where our shoulder blades would be, you've got two little dark dots. You can see them with the naked eye if you look very carefully on the underside of the leaves along the vein areas or use a time tens lens and you'll easily see them. Typical spider outline and of course those two little dark dots will confirm it as a two spotted spider mite. Now these are sap suckers and they take the energy out of the plant. 
one of the best culture controls you can do is to spray the plants with water and try to jet the water on the underside of the leaves. They do not like having their backs wet. They like to be dry or hot and dry and sunny. And of course they spread quite um, um, epidemically in hot dry conditions. So culturally um, spray tomatoes uh, with water on the underside, create humidity and that deters the pest. Now don't be afraid of spraying tomatoes over in the full sunshine. You are not going to scorch them. I've never come across of scorched tomatoes because of spraying over with water, even in greenhouses. It just doesn't happen. And one of the other pests that's um, common to everybody and I've noticed in my greenhouse in recent years of course are slugs and even snails. Now they usually emerge at night because of a falling temperature, rising humidity. They can't be observed, uh, they climb up the pots onto the grow bags, climb up the plant and uh, along the trusses and start to eat the ripening fruits. So it's very annoying when that happens. Now slugs um, can and snails can be picked off the plant and dispatched with a boot. That's a good common cultural method of doing it. You can of course um, get um, products like Slug Clear. Now this has got metaldehyde in it so you need to keep it away from pets and birds and cats and that that might come around so use it sparingly or you can use something like um, aluminium sulphate which um, is recommended by the Organic Association that is much safer to use and you can sprinkle a little bit of that around your tomato plants and try and um, um, knock them out before they have a chance to climb up the plant. Now the other way to do it of course is to sink some beer traps in the soil around the base of the plant but the uh, the jar with some beer in the bottom must be about the same level of soil and of course the slugs and snails are attracted to it and of course um, they go down into it and once they're in there they can't get out of the the beer that's in the bottom. A good old-fashioned way of dealing with slugs. Alternatively some um, grapefruit um, uh, jackets um, with the the, the flesh used up inside, turned upside down near to plants and the slugs will go under there, you upend it, take the slugs out and dispatch them. And two bricks, they never recover. Feeding tomatoes, absolutely crucial. Remember when we've planted into the grow bag, we've put the plants into a large pot, uh, we're growing them in hanging baskets, the compost that you've used there usually has four or five weeks of reserve nutrient in it, enough to get the plant established and launched on its career to production. But there comes a point when the first truss of fruits have set, the very low truss down there, and the fruits are just beginning to start to swell, that we need to think about giving some initial, an, additional nutrients. And we're thinking about giving plenty of potassium, high levels of potassium to promote good strong flowers, bowl flowers, and nice fruits with a good red colour in their cheeks. We want some phosphorus there to promote root growth and development. Don't forget, fruits contain a lot of phosphorus as well. And then of course we need nitrogen to promote shoot growth, leaf growth and fruit size. And really with the stems of tomatoes we're looking for something in the thickness of our thumb. So between May and August, high levels of nitrogen are required for tomatoes and not enough emphasis is given to that uh, when we talk about growing tomatoes. But one good product that I've been using over the years and many allotment holders have been using and keen amateur gardeners growing tomatoes of course is our friend Tomorite. It stood the test of time and is very popular to this day. Look here, it's got 4% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus and 8% potassium. A nice blend, useful amounts of nitrogen, adequate phosphate but higher levels of potassium and that combination has been relied on to promote good tomato growth for many years. Of course there may come a time when you find that the lower plants, the lower leaves on the, lower, on the bottom of the plants start to go yellow between the veins. This is what we call intervenal chlorosis and that usually indicates that you're getting magnesium deficiency. And that simply is caused because of insufficient magnesium in the compost and what's in the lower leaves gets transferred to the top leaves. The way to correct it is to get some Epsom salt, some magnesium sulphate and to mix about two ounces of salt into a gallon of um, water, mix it up thoroughly and then water it onto the soil around the plants and you can even spray it onto the, um, the leaves of the plant to boost the magnesium levels and usually that's sufficient to correct the deficiency. But another thing to watch out for of course is similar symptoms occurring in the tips of the young leaves at the top. 
intervenal chlorosis, veins stay green, the intervenal bits go yellow. If you get symptoms up there, that's trace element deficiency. Boron, manganese, iron is deficient and the cause can often be root death down in the growing bag. Too much watering, over watering, all the onto too much water in the bag. You need to improve the drainage and keep the root developing growing and then you won't get this trace element deficiency in the top of the plant.